We continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Ephesians here on Scripture Verse-by-Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we are in Ephesians chapter 5, and we resume our study in verse 25. Last time, we saw what God had to say about wives, among other things. Uh, But that's how we finished it up. Today, we're going to see what God has to say about husbands. So I hope you were with me last time. If not, I'd go back and I'd listen to that message. And then, well, you can listen to this one first if you want. However you want to do it, listen to both, though. And remember, you can study the whole Bible with me anytime you want to, as much as you want to, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. There are four series all the way through Genesis through Revelation, archived for you at the Bible, versebyverse.com. All you have to do is choose, click, and listen, and all you need to bring is your Bible. That's at the Bible, versebyverse.com. <clears throat> okay, Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth, in Jesus' name, amen. It wouldn't hurt to read verses 22 through 25. I will not comment on them. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That means that means do it for Jesus' sake. And it also means if your husband tells you to do something that's contrary to the word of God, no, you do not submit. It's as unto the Lord. You don't submit to any authority in this world if they tell you to do something that's contrary to the word of God. But here we go, assuming Your husband loves God, knows the word of God, and is leading according to God's word. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. Now, in Scripture, love doesn't have anything to do with feelings. Love means seeking the greatest good of others. God wants Christian husbands to be good to their wives, to do what is in their best interest, be good to her, even if she's not good back to you. That's how Jesus is toward us. He's good to us, even when we're not good to him. And by dying for us and paying for our sins, Jesus treated us as if we were worth more than he is. Consequently, a husband is to treat his wife like she is worth more than he is. Someone says, but but my wife doesn't let me lead her. She is always giving me a hard time. She's constantly nagging, constantly bucking my, my God-given authority. What do I do? You obey God. That's what you do. You love her as if she was as submissive as the Virgin Mary herself. You say, well, that's not fair and that's not easy. Well, since when did God say doing right would be easy and fair? That's not in the Bible. 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. God commands husbands to care for their wives as they care for themselves. In other words, love your wife to the same degree that you love yourself. Someone says, I don't love myself. That's my problem. I don't love myself. Hogwash. Everyone loves themselves, as we will see in a minute. God wants a husband 
to strive to make their wife happy, to do what is in their best interest, according to Scripture. In short, husbands should love their wives as they do their own selves. 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Stop right there for a second. I don't love myself. Most of my pastor told me. I need to work on self-love because I don't love myself. That's what the Christian psychologist on radio tells me. I need to work on my self-love. I just don't love myself. And then they have the nerve to turn this into an extra command. Where, where, God's, where God says, husbands, love your wives. Excuse me. Where were we? Men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. They, they have the nerve, they have the gall to say what, that this is a double command, that God is commanding husbands to love their own bodies, and then they can love their wives. That's what's taught in modern evangelicalism. See, God is command. He's not commanding you to love yourself. He's commanding you to love your wife as you already love yourself. Self-love is a given. It is a myth an unbiblical, unscriptural myth promoted by lukewarm modern evangelical pastors, teachers, and, and preachers, and psychologists and counselors that call themselves Christian. It is a myth to suggest that some people do not love themselves. You see, you're so dogmatic, Marat. Well, when God's word says something, I can be. We not only love ourselves, According to God, we cherish ourselves. Don't love myself. You cherish yourself. God has placed self-love in people so that they take care of themselves. Now, caring for self is sometimes done in a twisted, sinful way like everything else in this world. But people do nourish and cherish themselves. People want to like how they feel. People want to like how they look because they love and cherish themselves. People get upset when they don't like how they look. People get upset when they don't like how they feel. Why? Because they cherish themselves. You can search the Bible from cover to cover. And except in the puty mind of modern evangelical pastors and preachers and psychologists, except in their puny little pathetic unbiblical minds, you can search the scripture and you'll never see God commanding his people to love themselves. It's just not there. He doesn't have to. Because self-love is a given. So look at 29 again. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. God is saying that people love themselves <clears throat> with the same intensity that Christ loves Christians. That's how much you love yourself. And that is the same kind of self-sacrificing Caring love that God wants a Christian man to have for his wife. 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Men are to leave their mom and dad when they get married. And mom and dad need to let that son leave. In other words, parents of married children have no right to try to tell them what to do or how, how to run their life. Give suggestions? Maybe. But that married couple is a brand new family unit, autonomous before God. The man must answer, the man, the husband, 
The father must answer to God for how his new family functions. He's not going to answer to his mom and dad. Thirty-two. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. All this talk about a man and his wife is designed to illustrate the relationship between Christ and his church. The wife was made for her husband, just as the church was made for Christ. A husband is to care for his wife, just as Christ cares for for his church. If a husband wants to bless himself, then he ought to be a blessing to his wife. If a wife wants to bless herself, then she should be a blessing to her husband. 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. A Christian marriage should be mutually submissive, mutually loving, and self-sacrificing. A husband should love his wife, and he should be ready to sacrifice in order to meet her needs. A wife should submiss to, submiss, submit to her husband, meaning this, she should be willing to sacrifice what she wants for the sake of her husband. So you see, when those things happen with the husband and the wife, then you have a happy family. Then you have a good marriage. There is no other way. You, you can waste hours and hundreds upon thousands of do dollars at a Christian psychologist or a Christian counselor giving you this rigmarole, this roundabout workbook and assignments and all this other garbage trying to make you love each other, trying to give you a happy marriage. <laughs> I just gave you everything that you need. God gave you everything you needed for free. Well, it's too simplistic. Don't call God's word simplistic. I've had people say, well, that's too simplistic. You know you're insulting God. You're calling God simplistic. God's ways are not simplistic. They are simple, but they're not simplistic. They're not hard to understand. They're not complicated. I can't charge $200 an hour for tell, telling you these things. God would chastise me if I tried. They're simple. Straightforward in the Word of God. Do them and you'll have what God says you have. Nothing else will work. My friends, nothing else will work. There's no other way. No one needs any marriage counseling beyond what the Bible says because if they're not willing to do what the Bible says in simple terms right here, nothing else is going to work anyway. You're just going to waste your money and your time and you're going to make some counselor rich. Now, let's move on. Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Well, here we go again. Some, some Christian psychologist, I've heard them with my own ears, very popular modern evangelical icons on radio. I've heard them say that parents should explain to their children why they want them to do something. You've all heard these moms and even pathetically dads in the grocery store when their children are acting up and acting like little monsters and the, and, the, and the mom and the dad are saying, no, sweetheart, daddy doesn't like it. Mommy doesn't like it. This is why you should do what mommy wants you to do, okay? And then they go into this explanation. After they picked up my teeth from the floor, if I ever talked to my dad like that, I would have learned my lesson real quick and I never would have had to learn it again. And by the way, God says, spare the rod and spoil the child. God says, if you don't beat your child, and that doesn't mean what, that doesn't mean kill them or cause permanent damage. There's a good, good place for a spanking. You all know where it is. God says, if you don't do it, 
then you hate your child. This garbage that goes on today. And these Christian psychologists, parents should always explain to children why they want them to do something. Don't just tell your child to do something, but explain it to them. Explain why you want them to do it. And I'm not saying that that's never appropriate. It may be appropriate at times, but the Bible never since says that a parent must do that. These psychologists who call themselves Christians are a bunch of liars if they say that. These pastors and preachers and so-called Bible teachers who say that are lying to you. God never says that. In fact, just the opposite. Just the opposite. Notice what he says right here. Children, obey your parents. He gives you the why. Why, daddy? Because it's right. Why, mommy? Why do I have to obey you? Why? Because God says so. Because it's right. End of story. If you don't do it, you're in trouble with God. Not with me. You're in trouble with God. That's what kids need to learn. Disobedient children, rebellious children need to learn that they're in trouble with God even more than they're in trouble with, with their parents. And here's the deal. God doesn't always explain to us why things are the way they are. People don't, people do not do their children any kind of a favor by teaching them that they always deserve an explanation. Because they're going to have a real hard time when they grow up. They're going to have a hard time with God later on in life with that's their, if that's their attitude. Because God doesn't explain it. A lot of times he allows things to happen in our lives as Christians, obedient Christians, that we don't like, and he doesn't tell us why. It's a matter of faith. You trust him that he's working all things together for good, and you trust him that he's smarter than you are. A lot of times God asks us to do something that's contrary to our feelings. And a lot of his commands, he doesn't explain why. He just says, do it. Why? Because it's right. Obey God because it's right. Obey your parents because it's right. And he goes on. Verse 2, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. To honor means to respect the parent's authority. It is important for Christians. It is important for children to learn to respect the authority of their parents because their parents represent Almighty God. Their parents have the authority of God in that family. And so it's important for children to learn their, to learn to respect the authority of parents because by doing that, they are respecting the authority of God. And if children do not respect their parents, then they will not respect and they will, they will not respect other forms of authority outside the home, and they will ultimately not respect God. And you do them a real disservice by not making them respect your authority. And he says in 3, he goes on to say, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Failure to obey will result in unpleasant consequences. At least it should. I'm talking about obeying parents. It should result in unpleasant consequences. It should not go well with children who do not obey their parents because that sends the wrong signal. Letting children get away with rebellion teaches them that they can rebel against God and not suffer. That is why I've told this story. So a few years ago, I was in a big department store with groceries, doing some grocery shopping. Real, it was probably about eight o'clock in the morning, eight thirty in the morning. Not many people there. But I heard a child let out a scream, and it wasn't a, a scream of "I don't feel good." It was a scream of anger. He was furious. 
And it was a lot, one of the loudest screams I've ever heard. It was like a lion roaring in a zoo. And he did it about every 20 seconds, like old faithful the geyser. About every 20 seconds, he would do that. So I, I went throughout the store, did my shopping, and I heard him about every 20 seconds. Then I saw him, his mother. He was about, well, I don't know, three years old? I don't know, something like that. He was sitting in the cart, ticked off, really angry at his mother. And mom, stone face, never flinched. Never said a word to this little brat. Boy, I would have taken that kid outside and I would have pulled down his pants and I would have given him a good spanking. Because that's what God would want that parent to do. But not her. No. She just let him do that. So this went on. And I'm in the frozen food sections, right? And I got the doors open. I got, I'm in, in, inside the door grabbing something. And just as I'm pulling out, I hear this kid about two feet away from me let out his scream. I shut the door. I looked at that woman. I said, ma'am, you really need to discipline that son. Because you and I both know that he's just being a brat. And if you don't discipline that son of yours, he's going to grow up to be a monster. So I sat there. And she just looked at me. Never changed her expression. The same way she looked at that child who was such a brat. Never changed her expression. Just let him go on. And what I said, what I said to her, she just in one ear, out the other. I was the best friend that that woman ever had. And I'll tell you what else. I was the best friend that that child ever had too. It's been a few years ago. He's probably a juvenile delinquent by now. Or maybe he's even in jail. What a foolish, foolish parent. Letting your children get away with rebellion teaches that they can rebel against God and not suffer. Children who are disciplined in love, and I mean in love, you spank your child, it shouldn't be with hatred. It should be something that you hate to do, but you have to do it because God commands you. And when you're done, you ought to hug your child and tell them that you love them. Because it's a loving thing to do, even though it's a painful thing. Sometimes God allows painful things in our lives too, to discipline us, to chastise us. He does it because he loves us. Who the Lord loves, the Bible says he chastens. Doesn't feel good, but he does it because he love us, loves us. And if you love your child, you're going to discipline them. And you're going to discipline them in love. You're going to make it count, but you're going to discipline them in love. And then you ought to tell them that you love them too. And people who are children who are disciplined in love have a big advantage over those who are not disciplined at all and over those who are disciplined and not in a loving way too. I'm not advocating that. No, sir, because God doesn't. That's terrible. Four, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers are to raise their children in love. Children need to be disciplined because they need to be taught right and wrong. Children need to be disciplined for the same reason that God disciplines Christians, no matter how old they are, because we need to be taught right and wrong. And discipline is painful. It's very unpleasant. It hurts. Children need to be disciplined. They need to be taught right and wrong. And I'm not talking about stupid things that children do. I'm not talking about spilling the milk. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about children acting like children. I'm talking about willful rebellion. That's the thing that God wants punished. Willful rebellion needs to be punished.
But even in the midst of it, there needs to be understanding. Fathers should strive to be like God the Father, and when they fail, they should be honest enough to admit to their children so that the children don't get the wrong idea about God the Father. I can remember more than once when my son was real little, I got upset at him, and I didn't spank him. I only had to spank him once or twice, I think twice, just you know, all the while, because he knew that I would do it. He knew, and so I never had to. But I can remember probably a couple of times anyway when I got upset with him and I rebuked him, I got angry with him, and I realized in the middle of the night when God woke me up and said, you shouldn't have done that. He didn't do anything wrong. You know that? You were wrong. Oh, I felt so guilty. I was by Aaron's bedside. He's just a little fella. I was by Aaron's bedside when he woke up because I couldn't wait to tell him that Jesus rebuked me the night before and I never should have yelled at him. I never should have got angry at him. It was my fault and he didn't do anything wrong and Jesus wanted me to tell you that. I had to do that because I didn't want I didn't want Aaron to grow up with a warped view of God the Father who I'm supposed to represent. See? So don't provoke your children to anger. Don't don't be a disciplinarian when it's not deserved. And when you do make a mistake as a parent, own up to it. Because you can you're going to provoke your children to have a negative attitude toward God. And, and another way to provoke your children to wrath is for a parent to make foolish, petty demands just to show that they can do it. Your kid's not that stupid. He'll, he'll figure it out. Stupid, foolish, petty demands just to show that you can do it. I know parents that do that. A child soon learns that those mindless little rules have nothing to do with their parents training them or loving them. And since no one likes to be a punching bag, you're going to provoke them to anger, and that's what God forbids. You're in trouble with God for doing that. You love your children. You have a good time with your children. You enjoy your children. You discipline your children when they do wrong. When you discipline them when they don't do wrong, you apologize to them, and you explain that God isn't happy when you do that sort of thing. And you don't overdo it. You don't push them around. You don't punch them around like they're punching bags just because you're big and tough mom or dad and you can do it. They're going to grow up hating you and hating God. If you, if you claim to represent Almighty God and you're that foolish. Terrible thing to do. Five, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Doesn't matter who signs your payroll checks. Christians work for Christ. At least you're supposed to. Jesus is our boss. That's where you're supposed to look at it. Everything a Christian does at work or at school or whatever should be done with the idea that Christ is going to eventually call them into his office and evaluate their attitude and effort because one day he will do that. It's coming. So serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. We got to stop. We'll pick it up in verse 6 next time. Now, Remember, if you want to study the whole Bible with me, you can at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose from all 66 books of the Bible for complete series. Click and listen. I encourage you to begin in Genesis, go all the way through Revelation if you've never done that. And if you would like to be a part of this ministry, pray for me and pray for God's Word because that'll make you a part of this ministry right away. Or also, when you take a break from studying at thebibleversebyverse.com, if you go to the front page and you click the donate button, you can prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That also will make you a part of this ministry. 
and I appreciate it. And I appreciate you studying the Word of God with me here on Scripture Verse by Verse, and I'll see you next time in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Until then, so long, everyone.